Welcome to Through the Trauma Podcast. My name is Amber Larkins, published photographer, storytelling expert, visual artist, entrepreneur, speaker, and coach. This podcast was born from one question. How do I get inspiring stories of triumph out to the people who need to hear them the most? Come with me, enter my world, where lives are getting changed, heroes are getting developed, and greatness is being achieved. Hello, I am Amber Larkins. I'm your host. And today I have with me Miss Amanda Blackwood. She is a survivor of human trafficking who is now an accomplished artist and author, public speaker, podcast host, and trauma recovery mentor. Now, despite the numerous challenges that she's faced, she was able to emerge from this much stronger by the help of her faith. Now she helps other people. Amanda has shared her story on various platforms such as international summits, radio programs, and has published over a dozen books. Her two main podcasts seek to provide insight into healing and trauma. A portion of every book that Amanda sells goes to fight human trafficking. She lives in Denver, Colorado with her rescue cats and her supportive husband who keeps her sane. Amanda, thank you so much for being here today. It is absolutely my pleasure, Amber. When I first heard of your story, I had been looking for someone. Sex trafficking is a topic that has been on my heart for quite a while. And then after watching the the movie that had came out recently about sex trafficking, it had gotten even more like on my heart. And I ran into a friend who I knew and grew up with that had I learned was a victim and it has been it has been something that I truly feel like has been put on my heart to bring more awareness around and then when you reached out to me it was like this is I I, you're perfect to bring more awareness to this because this is what you're already doing right right absolutely this is what I my life's mission is now it's the reason I was kept alive through it all this is something that I, I, when I feel like people don't talk about, this is why I was so happy to see this movie come out because the regular people, we go about our day to day life. And unless we are engaging in learning more about this topic, we don't. And it's very easy to put out of sight, out of mind. We're not thinking about the people that are affected. We're not thinking about these things going on right under our nose, like literally we could pass people that are that are abducted or into this industry or dealing with a with you know into it in some way shape or form so i i want us to get into some of the details if we do come in contact with someone that's possibly somehow got put into that area of sex trafficking but i also want to hear from you as well because we just never know. You never know who has been affected by this. Let's go ahead and just kind of jump right in. If you want to share some of your story with us and kind of what what's led you here. Well, one of the big things that I always like to start with is what is trafficking? Mm. We have so many uh, misconstrued ideas of what it's supposed to look like because of different things like movies and news stations and news reports that are coming out. We as a collective here in the U.S. have no idea what it actually looks like. All we know is what's the sensationalized story. So I saw recently where somebody posted on Facebook that if a girl was 14 years old and she consented and her parents consented and somebody wanted to pay $5 million to be able to have her for a number of hours, would this be okay? No, absolutely not. So the Department of Homeland Security is where I go to for the overall definition of human trafficking. They define the use, the, uh, use of force, fraud, or coercion to obtain sex acts or labor from another person. If you notice, there's no mention of age. We think it only happens to people under the age of 18. That's not the case at all. There's no mention of money. We think prostitution equals human trafficking and vice versa. And while there's a huge overlap, that's not the case either. And there's no mention of transportation. Even though in our brains, we think of human trafficking as being in traffic, as in in your car and moving from one location to another, that is not at all what trafficking 
means. Another big, huge misconception is that human trafficking and human smuggling are the same thing, and they're just not. So telling my story only makes sense to people who truly understand kind of the basics of what it means. Now, one quarter of all victims are under the age of 18. Most are over the age of 18. The oldest in recent years to be pulled out of trafficking here in Colorado was in her 70s. The youngest was three months old. Oh. So I was trafficked three different times. The average number of times that someone is trafficked is seven. I was able to get out and survive. Less than 2% walk away with their lives. And with most survivors of human trafficking, we are no stranger to some sort of abuse in our early childhood. My mother was mentally and emotionally abusive. My father was physically abusive. And the first person to ever molest me when I was only four was my brother. And I say first person because it happened multiple times through multiple different assailants when I grew up. When you're four and something like this happens, and you're being treated like this as the youngest member in your family, you learn you don't have a voice. You don't have the ability or the strength to say no. They're going to do what they're going to do anyway. So you may as well just take it because maybe then it will end faster. And it's awful. So I grew up in this environment wanting desperately to get out. I started running away at 15 years old. I kept on getting dragged back by the police because they said that there was no physical evidence of the abuse. And eventually I just kept on running away and they just couldn't stop me. When I was 18, I left for the last time. So this, this is something that I would think with, with sexual abuse, because there is no, it's not like physical abuse where you have bruises or cuts or, but right. you have, you, it's, it's, there's nothing to show. So like you said, they, they can't, they can't see this. Right. Um, There's nothing physical to show. Mm -hmm. There's definitely personality changes that happens. And it's the same thing with physical abuse, too. You know, you can go to school and not show anybody the bruises that you have all up and down your back because you're not going to be taking your clothes off in front of the other students. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a black eye to be somebody who's a victim of physical abuse. You don't have to have any bruises or broken bones to be a victim of physical abuse. I I can see how there's a there's a, a the mindset, especially from abusers. We hear of abuse, and and in my, I don't know a lot about it, so I'm glad that we are speaking about it. But when you have someone who is abusive, it seems to me with sex, it's one of those things where it's like they can coerce you to believe that they care about you and they love you and they can almost gaslight you in a way of like, I'm here for you. And you begin to change your mindset in the sense of they care about me. This, this thing they're doing that's hurting me is out of love or concern, or I can see how there's a mindset shift where you can't really justify that with someone punching you. It's not even really comparable. Right. I grew up understanding that the people who loved me were the ones who hurt me. And if they didn't hurt me, they didn't love me. Do you think that there was something that caused your brother at such an early age to, to start engaging in this type of abuse? Oh, absolutely. I have no doubt. He was seven at the time. And if I really think back about that same time was when my mother took us in to a doctor because we had started to act out. I started to act out as a four-year-old child that had been molested. And I didn't know why it was that my brother had been acting out, but I assume it was probably the same. He was also around that same time uh, starting to have problems with wetting the bed. And that's usually indicative of a child that has been molested, especially among boys. So looking back, I don't hold him responsible for what happened to him. I also don't hold my parents responsible for what happened at that time because they can't be there 24 hours a day to see absolutely everything that happened. And I'm sure they assumed that I was safe with my brother. He was my brother and he was seven. 
But there was mm-hmm. definitely something that happened that his young seven-year-old brain was trying to understand. And the only way that a child at seven years old can really start to try to understand anything is to work through it. And he was using his little sister to try to work through this stuff to understand it better. So that I'm hearing a sense of compassion and empathy in your voice, especially towards him. Do you feel like you have forgiving, forgiven him? I have. And it took a long time to do, but I still will not allow him into my life. Uh, He is somebody who will do his best to try to discredit everything that I do or say now because he doesn't want to take any kind of ownership over his own past. Mm -hmm. And until he takes some kind of ownership and responsibility for what he did, not for whatever happened to him, but for what he did. Until he takes that responsibility, he's always going to approach anything and everything that I do with massive amounts of anger. So as Mm. much as I have forgiven him and don't hold him responsible, I cannot allow him into my life. Mm -hmm. That's understandable. That's understandable. Sometimes I think we have to forgive to heal ourselves. Um, But I can totally, boundaries is huge. I didn't mean right. to get you off track. I, I do, wanna, oh, no, I do want good. you to <laughs> finish telling your story. It's just I have so many questions because that is something that parents don't. I wouldn't think that. I would never consider that. And, and again, it goes back to what I was saying originally of, of this kind of out of sight, out of mind. We just want to ignore things and not be, not really be aware of what's happening. It's easier to say that something doesn't happen if you don't have solid proof than it is to do something about it even if you do mm-hmm. how do you yeah. how do you challenge your own child who's only 7 years old to say i know you've done this and this is wrong and let me explain why how do you approach that conversation with a 7 year old she would have been overwhelmed my mother was a very young mother she got pregnant on her honeymoon with my brother They got married when my mom was only 17 years old. My dad was 23, I guess, at the time. Mm -hmm. They were very young. And she would have been completely overwhelmed, not having any idea what to do. Yeah. So I don't really hold her responsible either. I can't. Yeah. That's understandable. I know who I was at that same age. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about your teenage years, like what that looked like. You ran away. Mm -hmm. And then what it looked like getting into human trafficking? Well, part of the reason I started running away at 15 goes back all the way to when I was four. So when my mom took us into the doctors, because we both started acting out, the doctors gave my brother his very own prescription for Ritalin. They told her that I was still fine. And that was right around the same time that the molestation occurred. So I hadn't really started acting out as much yet. So my mother, being the um, wise woman that she was, uh, she decided that the doctors did not tell her the truth about me. So she started breaking my brother's Ritalin in half and giving it to me every day illegally. When I was five and a half, she took me off for a few days, took me back into the doctors. And of course, as a five-year-old going through drug withdrawals and acting out from having been molested, I was really acting out. And they said, yes, there's definitely something up with her, too. And they gave me my own prescription. And at 15, when I started running away, I did not take the medication with me. I had been on it every day for a decade at that point, for most of my life. And when I didn't take it with me, and I didn't take it every day, I noticed a change in myself. I was more awake. I was more friendly and outgoing and capable of holding actual conversations with people and other kids in school stopped calling me the weirdo. I had enough brain cells to figure out I was a still a functional human being. And all these years later, I found out that the majority of kids that were diagnosed as ADHD in the 1980s, 90% of them were survivors of severe early trauma. They were not kids that had ADD or ADHD. It's heartbreaking looking back on it now and realizing how many people had to suffer because they were given Band-Aids. And when I started running away more and more and I kept on getting dragged back home, eventually I was put into foster care and 
I spent my 17th birthday in a foster care with a wonderful family who had three daughters. And for two weeks, they were my sisters. And when the cops came and picked me up and took me back home, they told this family that I had made up everything. And that family never spoke to me again. And I lost that little tiny sense of community that I had for the two weeks. It was one of the best birthdays I'd ever experienced. Being in somebody else's home. So when I was 18, I had had everything taken away from me. I had a mattress on the floor. I had one change of clothes and I had a nightgown. And I would come home from school and change into the nightgown so that I could wash that one change of clothes so that I could go to school in the same clothes again the next day. I had literally everything taken away from me, including my bedroom door. If I was going to change, I needed to change my clothes in the bathroom. I was so depressed. I was stealing clothes from Goodwill so that the kids would stop making fun of me. To this day, when I donate anything, I try to give it to Goodwill, trying to pay back my debt of all the stuff that I stole. (laughs) And when I was 18, two days afterward, I had a plane ticket to go to Arizona. And we were living in, in uh, northern Utah at the time. I had my dad give me a ride to the airport. He had a 1970 Chevelle that I absolutely loved and washed every single weekend that he would allow me to, to take it to the car shows. I didn't take it. He took it. But I wanted it to sparkle. And it was... I assumed the last ride I would ever take in that car. On the way there, we stopped at a Cracker Barrel, and he said, your mother and I were speaking last night, and she said she gives you six months before you come crawling back to us. I said, I give you three. And knowing how little they believed in me was enough to make me think I could never trust in them. I had already grown up believing that I couldn't trust in them anyway. So about eight months later, when I found myself living with a man I barely knew who was more than twice my age and calling him my boyfriend, and when he loaned me out to a buddy of his for a birthday weekend in Las Vegas, where I was locked up in a hotel room for 52 straight hours and had horrible things done to me, I could not call my parents to come and get me. I felt I didn't have any. I didn't have any family I could turn to. My father was military. We moved around so often when I was a kid. I never really formed deep bonds with anybody, so there were no friends I could call either. I also wasn't familiar with my own extended family, my grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. I had nobody I could turn to. I had never had anybody who was there to help me from the time I was four years old. And I knew... Even during that 52 hours at hotel room, I was alone. I had to put up with what was happening to me and what they were doing for 52 hours to be able to get back home to try to put together some kind of a plan to get out of there. And I did one of the worst things we can ever do to ourselves or to anybody else in our lives. I told myself, I've been through worse. I can get through this too. We have to stop telling ourselves that. We have to stop telling this to other people. This is not helpful. There is a phrase, the straw that broke the camel's back, and there's a reason it exists. Eventually, you will put too many stones on that pile, and you will build a mountain that you cannot climb alone. I got through it, and we got back to Arizona. I packed up my stuff, and I did what I had to, and I got out of there. And about a year later... I found myself sitting on a curb in a Daytona Beach bus station crying my eyes out because I had gone to stay with my grandmother. And when I asked her to come and get me from the bus station, her husband, my dad's stepfather, said, we're not coming to get you. You're on your own. Good luck. And hung up on me. I had finally found some kind of family that I felt like I trusted enough to be able to go and stay with them. And I took everything I had to get there. I had $5 left in my pocket while I was sitting there on the curb, and a young couple came and found me. Adam was in his early 20s. Jenny was 15, but she looked 18. And they told me they had a place for me to stay until I got on my feet. And what they really meant was they had a place that I could stay until they found the highest bidder because they sold me to a guy named Esteban. This was my second time being trafficked. 
I was basically locked up in a small room for 23 and a half hours with no food, no water, no bathroom facilities. There was a bed and a couch and a small table and a lamp and there were basics. But that was supposed to be my home from then on and I needed to find a way out. Thankfully, I grew up in the 80s and I absolutely loved the TV show MacGyver. <laughs> a man could fix anything with a paperclip and a rubber band. So I started looking around and thinking to myself, what would MacGyver do? And I found tools and I put them to use. I don't want to go into too many details because I did write about it. And it's quite the crazy adventure. And I just can't do it justice just telling the story. <laughs> but when that door opened and I got out, I ran into this bright world after being locked up in this dark room for so long. And I was blinded. I couldn't see really where I was going but I ran straight into the street and I ran to the first person I could find. And it was a female police officer in a patrol car. And I flagged her down. And I didn't realize at the time I was in one of the worst parts of Daytona Beach, Florida. She probably assumed I was on drugs, <laughs> pretty hardcore drugs, the way I was screaming and ranting. But she didn't believe me. I kept on trying to tell her what was going on, what had happened, who I got away from, and that's him back there, and he's driving, uh, trying to get me, and I need help. And she saw this guy do an illegal U-turn, and he did this after he saw me talking to a police officer. She did a U-turn and went after him, and I never followed up. I never went to the police station to see if they arrested him. I never went to see if anybody else from that place got out. I knew I wasn't alone there. Okay, so I have a question here. How old were you when this mm -hmm. happened? The first time I was 18, the second time I was 19. Okay. And when, at what point did you realize, so when they approach you at the bus station, they seem like a nice couple, and you willingly go with them to, to, to help get on your feet and believe them. At what point did you realize this is not what it seems? After about the first week there, Adam came in one night with a serrated edge knife and raped me at knife point. That's when I knew things were going very bad very quickly. And I there, had nowhere to go. Were there other girls there? No, there were at Esteban's place. But I do believe that Adam and Esteban had an agreement an arrangement of sorts and this wasn't the first time they had done this when I was locked up in the building where Esteban had me there had been doors down this long hallway I can still see them now and the first door was the one where I was it was the first door on the right but there was a door across the hall and two more and then two more all the way down at the end of the hall was a bathroom and when I was when I first walked in there I heard nothing but after I was locked into that room and Esteban left out of that main door again, I heard what sounded like crying, whimpering. And I laid down on the floor and I put my ear up against the, the crack under the door to listen. And I heard other, the other voices down that hall crying and saying, somebody, please help me. Is there anybody out there? And I so, knew this was probably one of the worst positions I'd ever been in in my life. So you knew what the outside of that door looked like. Do you believe the other girls knew what the outside of that, that door looked like? I don't know. I have no idea. I hope they found it eventually. And the house you escaped from was Esteban's house? Yeah. Ah. <sighs> That is, that is a lot. And uh, these are things that we hear, we see, you know, in movies. But again, it goes back, and I'm even guilty of this myself, of just, just not realizing the severity of the situation. I am so sorry you've gone through all of this. I never will be. And the reason for that is because, you know, early on I, I talked about how less than 2% survive. If it hadn't been me going through this again and again, it would have been somebody else. And they likely would not have survived. The fact is that I'm still here. 
and I was given this ability to write about it, to speak about it. I was given all of these gifts out of it. Now, I heard somebody just say just a few days ago, what was the gift from that darkness? And if you look for it, there is always a gift from it. The gift for me was that I learned about what all of this is. I learned enough to be able to speak up and help pull somebody else out of it. I've had people reach out to me several times now and say, learning about you has helped me to stand up. It's taught me how to get out. It got me to go find help that I needed. You know, and when I first started doing this, I said, if I can reach just one person, that will be enough for me. But that was one of the biggest lies I ever told myself. One person is not enough. Mm -hmm. I'm addicted to it. <laughs> now I want to hear that every day. I want to hear somebody say, I'm better now. Thank you. How many other times? You said there were seven, there were seven times that you were trafficked? The average is seven. I was only trafficked three times. So there's only one time following all of this. And that was, gosh, that one was crazy. Uh, the first time I was 18, the second time I was 19, I got out of Florida. I left there and ran as far as I could, which was California. I didn't have a passport. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up out there in the Los Angeles area. My goal there was that I wanted to eventually become an as assistant to somebody who was important because that would mean vicariously I would be important. And I didn't see myself as having any kind of personal importance outside of being important to somebody. That's all my life ever was, was servitude to others. I was going to make it work for me. Mm -hmm. Instead, I was on Alias and Will and Grace, and I modeled for Harley Davidson. I did a lot of really cool stuff. But I couldn't find that position in life that I was looking for. I could not find the way to make myself feel important. Eventually, and this was about the time internet dating became a big thing. So in 2004, I met a man online and he lived really far away. So we were going to just be pen pals. And I shared all of my stuff with him. And he was a really safe person for me to tell all this stuff to. And he helped me through some really hard times. He was kind of like a free therapist. He was great. We loved each other dearly. He came to visit me and I went to go and visit him. And he watched me kind of navigate my life and Eventually, I became a mall cop, and within five months, I had busted open a major embezzlement ring, and I had become the director of public safety and security for six properties in Los Angeles County and had climbed all the way to the top of the food chain. I'd gotten an $11,000 a year raise. I had gotten raises for all of my employees. I was sitting on top of the world. I had my first apartment by myself. I didn't need anybody, and I was doing so well, and he was so proud of me. And he asked me to get a fiancé visa and move to Scotland to go and be with him for the rest of my life in the land of kings and castles and romance and beauty. And I gave up everything. It took him seven years of us getting to know each other to get me there. And it took him seven days to start trafficking me once he did. I was 31 years old. This man had worked on me for years. And it was probably one of the biggest betrayals I'd ever experienced. He had my passport, my debit card, my driver's license, all that stuff within hours of me landing. He told me that they were only going to be for safekeeping. Because, you know, he knew the neighborhood and he knew the crime rates and stuff around there much better than I would. I had only been there visiting. I didn't actually live there before. I trusted him. He was also a police officer. I gave him absolutely 100% of my trust. But this became a revolving door. One of the other biggest misconceptions that I run into all the time is that people believe that to be able to end up in the world of trafficking, people are kidnapped and put there. That makes up 1% to 2% of all cases. In every single instance where I was trafficked, it started out exactly the same way standard domestic violence would. These are people that I felt like I knew and I could trust. They were people who had a sense of authority over my life in one way or another. And they were people who 
could find my weaknesses and deepest needs and offer those things to me to coerce me to be where they needed me to be vulnerable. When I was in uh, Arizona, what I needed was a home and somebody to support me and love me. And that's what that man gave me. So I thought. When I was in Florida, stranded on the side of the road at 1030 at night, broke, hungry, alone, cold, abandoned, a young couple came and found me and they offered me shelter and kindness and all the things that I didn't have. They offered me a sense of family. And when I went to Scotland, I had gotten everything I had ever wanted except love. I was still looking for love from wherever I could find it. And that's what he offered me to. I gave up everything to go and find it. And he took everything away that I ever cherished. I lost my dignity my self-respect. During five months that I was there, I nearly lost a kidney. I lost 78 pounds. I developed Crohn's disease and he kept on feeding me stuff that he knew would make me sick. And he did this on purpose because he knew the thinner he kept me, the more money he could charge. He also knew that since I had been on Alias and Will and Grace and had modeled for Harley Davidson, if he showed this stuff off, this really cool stuff, he could charge more. And I became ashamed of the neat things that I had done. I became ashamed of who I had been because he used it all against me. I tried to end my own life one day while I was out there. I'd gotten out of the house and I went down to a very old church. It was built in, I believe, the 1600s. And the oldest headstone that I could still read the date on said 1776. And I took that as a sign. Now, for anybody listening who's not in the U.S., 1776 is the year that we claimed our independence from England. Scotland is now part of the United Kingdom. I saw this as a sign of, if I stay here, I can claim my independence from this man here in Scotland. Maybe if I stay right here, somebody will see me. Somebody will pay attention. Somebody will offer me help. Because I couldn't go and ask for help. He was the police. And nobody came. And I sat there and I talked for an hour to a body that was six feet under. That was my best friend. That was my only friend that day. Eventually, after about an hour, nobody came. And I got up and I tried the doors of the church and they were locked. And I sat on the steps for a long time. And I prayed again, please send somebody to see me. And nobody came. People walked by. People drove by. I could see people looking at me, but they all had this look on their face of, she's having a bad day. I don't want to get involved. Not my circus, not my monkeys. We hear that a lot now. We are all the same monkeys. (laughs) Sometimes we're going to have to stop and we're going to have to ask the monkeys, hey, you all right? Do you need a banana? Nobody stopped to ask me if I was okay. And I knew that I couldn't make these people care. It was a small town in Scotland. You would think somebody would stop. And I got up and I headed to the train station. At the time, I was a smoker. And when I left the house that morning, I had taken one single cigarette with me because it was going to be my last. I stepped out onto the train platform and I lit my cigarette. I put my lighter back into my pocket. My plan, as I sat there and looked down at the tracks, was once I was done with my cigarette... I'd sit there and wait for the train. And when I heard that it was far off in the distance, I would walk down the tracks parallel to them for a long time. And when the train got close enough, I would end my life by jumping in front of the train. And a man walked out onto the platform and he saw me smoking my cigarette and he broke my thought and he asked me for a light. And I handed him my light and I told him, you can keep it. I won't need it anymore. And the reason I said this to him was because I wanted him to ask me why. But he didn't ask. And this was just another person that I couldn't make care. And then a little boy walked out onto that platform and took that man's hand. And that little boy looked at me. 
He was about four. And he didn't just look at me and look away like everybody else. He looked at me and he saw right through me. You know how when we're around a little kid and a kid can see we're having a bad day and we do what we can to try and cheer ourselves up so we don't make this kid feel down in the dumps and try to make goofy faces and try to be happy for them? It didn't work. I tried, but it didn't work. And he looked at me with the deepest concern. And he just, his eyes got so wide. He knew, he knew things I didn't know. And it took me about 20 seconds to realize that I wasn't running toward the train. I was running back toward my prison. And I was thanking God for a miracle that I hadn't yet received because if I was going to be kept alive in that moment, there had to be a purpose for my life. And it was not going to end unceremoniously by train. I was not going to take away the innocence of a child the way it had been done to me so many years ago. I put together another plan. And I eventually got my way out of Scotland. I nearly died three times while I was there. Once by a kidney infection so severe it caused me to miss an emergency flight that I had spent all of my money trying to get. Once by train. Once by him torturing me. I was waterboarded. I had food deprivation. And as far as I can tell, I went eight and a half days without sleep. That will be enough to drive anybody mad. And I thought things were better the second I got away. My life is going to be better. I'm going to disappear. None of this is ever going to bother me again. I tried to change who I was. I had really short hair back then. I grew my hair out. I tried to change the color of my hair. I changed my personality as much as I could. I changed my style of dress. <coughs> but he kept on chasing me. He came over here looking for me. Found him knocking on the neighbor's door one day. He had my address off by one number. I hid, cowered, inside, behind the door. I told my roommates what was going on so that they would know not to answer the door to somebody like that. And I moved, and I moved again, and I moved again, and again, and again. Eventually, I packed up a U-Haul, and packed up my cats. At that point, I had gathered four. I had somebody crack a joke at me once and said, you know what cats are? And I said, what's that? They said, man repellent. I said, why do you think I got another one? <laughs> Ended up with four cats trying to just be the crazy cat lady. And I made my way out to Colorado in 2016. And in 2019, I found out that that man made me famous on a pornography website using photos and videos of me being raped. 85% of modern pornography, all modern pornography, is created using victims of human trafficking. And this was something that I didn't want to believe and I didn't want to acknowledge until it happened to me. I've heard this. I've heard this as well. I've, I've posted about it because it's sickening. That's sickening. Um, yeah. Was it Pornhub? It was all of them. There were thousands of websites where this stuff was showing up. Yeah. I didn't know how to move past this. Yeah. I lost my job over this. My boss found out I was a survivor of human trafficking, and a week later I was out on my butt looking for a job. It was the week before Thanksgiving 2019. It was the worst time to possibly lose a job. Right before a pandemic hit, right? Well... Just my luck, I found something in the health industry which was going to be booming. <laughs> and the company that I was working for was working in the entertainment industry, building concert stages. They flopped hard. It was the best timing for something like that to happen. I thought at the time it was the worst. It really was a blessing in disguise. <laughs> but I reached out to an anti-trafficking uh, organization that I had gotten to know the year before. I had gone to an anti-trafficking rally, an event, and I didn't know what human trafficking was at the time. So I was all about going in to save the kids because I'd been through terrible stuff, but not trafficking. 
Hmm. And I learned the truth that day of what trafficking actually was. And it started to kind of play around in my mind. And I got involved in these little organizations and groups and you know, wanting to be a little bit of a part of it because I was looking for a way to ask for help and didn't know how. And when all of this happened, they paired me up with another organization that provides legal services to survivors of trafficking pro bono. I was paired up with a, a law firm in New York City that went after all these different pornography websites and they were having them pull all this stuff down every time I sent them a link. It was amazing how hard they worked at this. And then they paired me up with a therapist. And the first therapist they paired me up with, I traumatized her so bad, she left the industry forever. She's done. So they had to pair me up with a second one. She was great. She'd already worked with other survivors of trafficking. So it's really important to find somebody who knows what they're doing, has experience in that field specifically. So this lady, when I went in and talked to her, I told her, I don't trust you because I don't trust anyone. But don't treat me like I'm some, bra some fragile, broken thing, because if I was going to break that hard, I'd have done it already. And don't come at me with prescription medication because I've been there. I'm not looking for a Band-Aid. I need a shovel. Somebody else dug a hole and threw me in and it's time to get out of it. And we got busy. And by the end of 2020, it took me 30 days and I wrote my entire 350 page autobiography. It was time to move beyond the past. So I gave it a physical body separate from my own. And I was able to set it down on a shelf and walk away from it anytime I needed to. Oh my gosh, girl. That's... For... There's like not even words. And e even hearing you speak, there's like, I don't know, like the listeners that are listening to this, but I do know myself. I don't know what emotion to take. You know what I mean? I'm not sure if I should cry in, you know, empathy and in, in that this is, this happened to you and it's happening to others and it's happening to people right now as we speak. I don't know whether to be pissed. Like, I just want to <laughs> go, you know, like my, my resounding question is what what can we do what what can people do people that like myself that get very angry here in these things that someone can take that kind of advantage of another human being what kind of person can do that that's what i'm not i don't know but obviously we have those kind of people in the world and we live in a very sadistic world and I'm, it breaks my heart. And the more that I do the podcast, the more that I hear stories, but, but then there's these stories that are like yours that are like so impactful. And there's something that, that's something that has, you know, it is near and dear to my heart. I, I was, I've never been involved in, in sex trafficking other than the fact of being in learning about, learning about it and having empathy for it. And when I read this about the, the sites, the porn sites, that a lot of this was abuse and that as culture begins to, it's a downward spiral and it gets worse and worse and worse. And when you engage, it's like people think that porn is one of these things that it's just a little bit of entertainment. We just watch a little bit of porn and, you know, it's, it's entertainment. It's not entertainment. It's not because eventually that gets to be not enough. And then that gets to be not enough. And before you know it, we're in this place that where these companies are producing things that is pure violence. And then you have regular people who's condoning it, watching it and spending money on it. So I guess without going into too much of a rant, because I could for hours on this, but <laughs> What are we to do? Like, if you had advice for someone, like just in general topic, 
just in general public, what, what that has never really experienced this, would you say the first step is getting educated? That's a big one. What I run into more often than not are people who honestly, truly believe that human trafficking here in the U.S. only looks like young children being kidnapped by weird looking guys driving driving windowless vans. And that's just not the case. When people want to talk about human trafficking, they I, I see posts online all the time about, I was followed through a parking lot. It has to be sex trafficking. First of all, no. Unless you talk to that guy, you have no idea what his intentions were. He might have been at trying to ask for your phone number. He might have thought you were cute. He also might be a violent rapist. The chances of him being a trafficker are very slim because of those odds of 1% to 2% of all victims being kidnapped. If somebody's kidnapped... They fight for their life. If somebody is being coerced, forced, or frauded into committing these acts by somebody that they already know, like their parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, boyfriends, girlfriends, they're going to be much more easy to manipulate because they already trust you. Kidnapping somebody to, for this purpose is incredibly rare because it's incredibly difficult. It's also really important to educate ourselves on the idea of using the terminology sex trafficking. Sex trafficking is, let's say it's a watered down version of what it actually is that happened to me. Saying the phrase sex trafficking is like speaking with some kind of an abstract innocence. It's a shield confronting people from the monstrous realities that victims actually endure. It's not just sex. It's, you know, people out there playing 18 holes of golf while they're talking about sex trafficking and thinking that they're doing something to help when really what they should be talking about is incest, stranger rape, acquaintance rape, child sex abuse, sex abuse, uh, serial rape, statutory rape, domestic violence. It's, it's amazing the types of sex trafficking that actually exists. This is why I always introduce myself as a human trafficking survivor, because primarily I'm not sex. I am human. People forgot that I was human. And I'm here to remind them forever that I am human, not a sex object. Sex trafficking is f about 14% of the world's problem with trafficking, but that's all we talk about here because that's what's most prevalent in the U.S. and that's what's, what is the most prevalent in the media. The majority of human trafficking worldwide is labor trafficking. We need to better educate ourselves. We need to better educate those around us. And we need to put a stop to these rumors of people saying that just because they were followed through a parking lot, that they were going to be a victim of human trafficking. I've been called a liar because my story doesn't look like how certain movies or media portray it. Because I wasn't a small child when it happened to me. Because I wasn't kidnapped by a total stranger. And because I wasn't rescued by a self-proclaimed hero. Yeah. And I, I think too, that there's this, this thing that as humans, we can, not all of us, but it, it's a natural human tendency that we can get, fall into this mindset of, well, they kind of, you know, that's some fault of their own. Kids, yeah. no. Although maybe, I don't know. But you think like girls that are teenage girls like oh well they projected this or you know this is like a a temptation I feel like for a lot of human beings to think well just like what I hear when you're talking about the people walking past you at this church you know how many of them walked past you and just thought nah, she's having a bad day it's probably something that she's walked into and right this is such a wrong way of thinking because I, I'm asking myself, when I hear stories like yours, what would I do in that situation? What do we expect people to do in that situation? And then not only are you not able to make 
educated decisions in this, in a situation like this, you are a child still as a teenager, and you're a child who is already dealing with childhood trauma. But regardless, I understand to an extent, I, I can't, I can empathize. I can't fully understand. And, and I think this is why it is so important for someone like you to step up and share stories like this. I can understand to an extent because for years I worked in a strip club. How many women did I come in contact with that was there because they were being trafficked or was leaving there and going home to a pimp or someone who was, who was selling them out? I look back on those years. I, I never even thought of it and never even knew, but I praise God every day that I didn't get caught up because it could have ended much worse. My situation didn't end. It, I mean, it, it almost killed me. I, I was, I was very, I was a miserable person, but I was the person who chose to be there. I had a good family upbringing. I, I chose to be in that situation. And I think this is why I have such empathy for this now is because looking back, I realized all the places that could have gone really bad for me and they didn't. This is part of the reason I think why it's so on my heart so much because I wish that I could go back into these places and rescue the people that are there. And in fact, when I first got really clear on my purpose, that was one of the words, you know, people pick these words that define them. And I truly feel like my word is rescue. And I wonder like, if that's not your word as well, you are doing this on a much larger scale, you can relate to these kinds of things much, much bigger than, than I ever could. But what you are doing is so powerful and so impactful. And I honestly like hearing your story. I'm praising God that you made it through that, that you didn't take your life, that you, because the amount of lives that you are impacting and not just the women that are survivors that are, and, and men, it can go both ways. Am I right? Absolutely. 46% men and boys. Yeah. So you're doing a, a very impactful and powerful work, but not only for the survivors, but also for the people who need to be, there needs to be an awareness raised around this. It's a part of human nature that is really ugly. It's, it's a big struggle in the world. I mean, I, I was um, compared to Sisyphus recently. If you're familiar with Greek mythology, that's the man who was uh, forced to roll a boulder up a hill. Every time he got near the top of the hill or the mountain, uh, something would happen. He would lose his grip and it would roll all the way back down to the bottom of the mountain. He'd have to start rolling that boulder again. Somebody asked me one day, how do we manage as Sisyphus? to finally get that boulder at the top of the mountain. And I said, you need more than two hands. This isn't a journey that I'm making alone. If my husband wasn't the amazing supportive man that he is, I wouldn't be able to do this. If I didn't have people like you in my life, allowing my voice to be heard, I wouldn't be heard. And if I didn't have stages to speak on, if I didn't have people reading my books, if I didn't have people reaching out, I wouldn't be able to make any kind of an impact. So I don't know if necessarily rescue is my word. I think my word is reach. Mm -hmm. how, how can I, or people that are listening, how can we support you? How can we help further what you're doing? Because your work is very powerful. Thank you. Probably one of the biggest ways is to uh, grab one of my books. My autobiography is called Custom Justice. It's available worldwide through Barnes and Noble. Um, and I believe Amazon is finally starting to carry it, but that one's still a little iffy. They stopped carrying my book for a long time and refused to tell me why. Hmm. But that book in particular, if you do get a hold of this book and you read it, pass it along to somebody else. I don't care if you buy another copy or not. Give it to somebody else who can find some value in it. 
pass it along, have somebody else read it. Maybe someday it might end up in the right hands of somebody who needs it right now. Show them that there is another way out. Mm -hmm. So the best way to, to support me is honestly by supporting others, educating. No, my book is a great way of doing that. There's plenty of other resources online. My website has several. Um, you can always interact with me through social media. If you're looking for organizations to be able to work with, that's the best way to help me. Find somebody, find some way of being able to help. And if you're looking for an organization to be able to work with and you're afraid of just giving your money blindly to somebody, call that organization and ask them what their physical needs are. Do they need toothbrushes? Do they need toothpaste? Do they need socks? Do they need coats? Do they need blankets? If they need physical things and they're willing to take physical things from you, they need the money too. And if you call them and you say, what physical items do you need? And they say, oh no, we don't need anything. We just need your money. They're not doing the work. They're lining the pockets and they don't need your help. We'll put all of your information in the show notes, but for all of the people listening, can you just share where they could find you, your website, your social media, how, and your, the names of your books? So my website is growthfromdarkness.com. Once it gets going, I will have a second website called detailedpieces.com. These are both geared toward my uh, uh, public speaking and uh, the books and everything. I currently have 13 books available, so I'll only go down through a couple of them. Custom Justice is the full autobiography. It doesn't go into detail of what happened in Florida. So that book is called Detailed Pieces of a Shattered Dream. I do have my most recent book. I'm super excited about it. It came out in June. It is actually my first cookbook. It's called Surviving in the Kitchen, Recipes for Life, Love, and a Full Stomach. And the reason I love cooking is the same reason that I love painting and writing. It's because we need to have a sense of control of some kind in our lives. And we have to find healthy, creative ways of being able to control that environment. And it's, Cooking, writing, painting, all these creative outlets are just such healthy ways of being able to do that. They were instrumental in my, my own recovery. Mm. I've got a ton of books, though. Probably my top selling book right now is The Road We Left Behind, and it has nothing to do with me. It is my grandmother's story as a wing walker in the 1930s and 40s, and her first love, the pilot. I love it. And listen, if you like what she's done here today, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind, you are a natural born storyteller because I was engaged throughout your story. And it's, it's something that I feel like truly like you're blessed to do. Like you are gifted to do this thing of sharing stories and you have an ability to pull people in emotionally. And I'm positive if you can do that in speaking I'm positive you can do that in in written word in your books um, so if someone wanted to learn more about trafficking or just educate themselves more about that particular thing is there a book that you have that you would recommend to start there I would say custom justice it goes through a lot of the different statistics and a lot of the myths and stuff of human trafficking early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amanda, wow. Your story is so, oh, if you're watching on video, she just flashed the book. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You, you are such an impactful person and I am so blessed to know you and I look forward to, you know, connecting with you more in the, in the future. I would, there's so many directions in this conversation that we could spend multiple hours talking about um, specifically, but I know that you are doing amazing work and I know that you're impacting way more than just one. Um, you have impacted me here today in a major way. And I just want you to know that your, your work and your mission, it doesn't go unnoticed. Thank you so much, Amber. Honestly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Real fast, last question here. Do you have any last like key takeaways 
or final thoughts that you would like to just kind of leave our audience with? No matter what it is that you've been through, trauma changes your brain. You change your life. And we've heard constantly, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that's a lie. It always has been. That phrase was coined by a man by the name of Frederick Nietzsche in the 1800s, shortly before he died in an insane asylum. <laughs> the truth is that the strength has always been within us. It was given to us a long time ago. We can stop giving credit to these abusers, to the traumas, to these terrible people in our lives. Start giving credit where it's due. You're the one who got out. You're the one who has the strength and the ability to get out. And if you're not out yet, it is not a weakness to ask for help. It is a strength. And that's why it's so hard to do. That's so beautiful, Amanda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Amber. Thank you for listening to Through the Trauma Podcast. If you have found value in this episode or believe in the mission behind what we are doing, please subscribe so that you never miss any future episodes. Also, be sure to check out our Transformation Project at transformationthroughtraumaproject.com, where we help inspirational stories get heard on a larger scale through multiple platforms. If you know someone who can benefit from this episode, please share it with them. Until next time.